Right, well, um, interestingly, my talk sort of goes along with yours a bit, but also a bit against it, I would say, uh, because I'm trying to both give you an overview of, of what the Occupy movement is about, and uh, specifically in London, how some of the ethnographies, well, not ethnography, because I'm not, I've not been actively doing an ethnography of Occupy London. I've been involved as one of the people involved just like everyone else since uh, 15th of October. Uh, but so these are some, some of my reflections on a bit of a sideways look. At the same time, so I'm trying to look at how anthropology, how we can both look anthropologically at the movement and how the movement can sort of give us new ways of thinking about uh, different theories and sort of try to intermesh it a bit because people in these movements actively use theory uh, to defend their projects, etc. So I think it's really important to actually consider how it is theoretically relevant or how theory is relevant to it because people apply theory to it. Um, so I'm calling this a sideways look at the Occupy movement because that's sort of what I'm doing. Um, and uh, so a bit of background just on what the Occupy movement is and does. It started sort of, you all know the Arab Spring and then there was the Spanish movement um, on the 15th of May last year, Occupy Wall Street started on 17th of September, and all these sort of somehow connected, and we all identify with each other to a certain extent, but then sort of Occupy London Stock Exchange was part of the 15th of October call out. There was a Facebook event that some people have been working on uh, behind. Like it was planned, but a lot of the people who got involved were not part of the planning group. They showed up on the 15th and came back or got involved later. So there's sort of over a thousand applications across the world um, or that have <coughs> been or are in existence and in all five continents. So it's quite a big thing. Um, and as I said, they're different but similar and they hold assemblies, meetings, so that there's direct actions and it's about sort of the occupation of public space. Um, and uh, what I sort of want to draw on in the theoretical bit of it, is, in a way, is that, as I said, anthropology and, surprisingly, I would say actually feminism can be used as a way to look at this movement and what it's doing. I argue that it's doing uh, a lot of the same things that feminism was doing 30 years ago, um, and that there's a lot of potential in the movement if it can build on those issues, build on those viewpoints, but I'll get to that. Uh, it's also a bit of a nomad thought and a Deleuzean note in the sense that it's it's a line of flight potentially. Uh, the question is whether it can actually sort of manifest itself as such. Uh, so as I said, it started on the 15th of October. What's really fascinating about it is it's a reimagining of public space very much. It's sort of managed to manifest itself as uh, as an open space for debate. So where. St. Paul's or like all these squares around Europe have sort of been silent for many years. It's become this, people go out into the streets, it's become normal to discuss politics with friends and with strangers. Um, and it's really interesting how they've managed to do this because they've completely shifted the climate of the debate. And it's also a sort of mimetic realization of an alternative system. You set up a tent camp in the middle of London and people are living, have, have been, it's been evicted now, it was evicted last week, on Tuesday, or sort of Monday, um, and uh, Monday night to Tuesday. And it's been, um, I mean, sort of, yeah. It, but what's really interesting about Occupy London especially is that it's been this entanglement with law that's like, it exists for, um, for um, four months in London because this is this is St Paul's. So it doesn't show up very clearly. Uh, this is what they tried to get on the 15th of October. Patterns of Square is private land. Uh, it looks like public land. It is private. So they got an injunction. There were police forces all around it. They kept in the protesters in these two areas, and they set up square there. And the, they had this complete entanglement with law because it's privately owned, but it's public land, and then. Uh, you're not allowed without a planning permission to set up structures, so they set up tents and there's been this court case going around with that. But as I said, like what it's done, uh, I take a sort of Benjaminian look at this as well, in the sense that past makes itself in the present. So they, through the court case, have managed to sort of get all the arguments of why the occupation is really important, 
political history to create the space, to create an alternative society structure, etc., has been recorded in the court, which is a really, really interesting thing. Um, and they've become this triangle of, of like, with the church and what would Jesus do? And Jesus would have been up there with the protesters. So it's a really like symbolic fight against the corporations through religion and exposing the city of London as this really corrupt, undemocratic body uh, and sort of calling them out into, into the open as something that you can put down. Um, and therefore it's sort of like the big fight against capitalism. And as I said, been there for four months. Um, it's demonstrating there's an alternative and there's uh, the Ten City University, which is like this free education thing where people have come in and talked from various viewpoints. Um, not sure if you ever came again and could talk, Chris, but you should if you haven't. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there, there, there will be chances in future. Uh, Camilla's done uh, things there. And uh, basically, it's sort of an education, free education thing. So informing oneself has been really important. And then there's sort of like a kitchen. And so it's making a community, but it's also thrown up a lot of problems in terms of drugs and alcohol, um, because there's a lot of homeless people who joined the camp uh, and who then, you know, uh, are being alcohol or drug addicted, sort of cause problems in the camp. But that is more a problem of society in general than a specific problem of the camp, because the city of London and Westminster have some of the biggest proportion of rough sleepers in all of London. Um, and so, you know, free food, open, inclusive community. <laughs> but um, what I want to sort of shortly get on to is the way it's sort of deconstructing capitalism in a way, because um, as Butler says, it's sort of putting the current system in quotation marks, <coughs> literally through realizing an alternative in the city of London, saying, like, we don't have to exist this way. We can exist in a different way, even in the middle of capitalism. Um, at the same time, like David Graeber has been involved in Wall Street, sort of you know, exposing the roots of global inequality, the book that he's written on debt, and how uh, we've sort of been um, indoctrinated to look at it in a certain way, whereas it might be slightly different. The mimetic becoming of another, which I mentioned, uh, and then sort of was a minority discourse to subvert the current system. You can see how all these sort of theoretical, uh, what do you call it, uh, theoretical ways of looking at viewpoints are going into each other, interlinking to a certain extent. Uh, but my main thing is how it's sort of looking a little bit like feminism. Uh, because there's no shared identity, so alliances by shared interest. The Occupy has had a lot of criticism for not sort of having an overall program. Or, but it does have, but it has seven ratified statements by the General Assembly, so it does have a lot of sort of common um, ideas. But there's no sort of share, it's more an assemblage than, um, that is autonomous than it is sort of everyone signing up to one program. And that's sort of, it looks unclear in the media, but it's also very strong for the people who join it because you join it as an individual. Uh, that, and there's this inclusivity of it and a compassion to it, which I, was, I sort of think has a lot in common with the feminist movement in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there's a big focus on empowerment and active subjects that you have, everyone has the same, um, same influence and same ability to speak in general assemblies, etc., etc. Um, and so it's sort of facilitating people to become empowered, questioning people rather than just going along with the flow, along with the flow of capitalism. Um, so I'm ending this with a little sort of Benjaminian hope for a future. Uh, with a, this was uh, the Occupied Times editorial that was published uh, on two days after the, the uh, eviction. Um, and it's sort of showing a lot of the points that I was trying to take across with. But they are very reflexively, actively participating in the rewriting of history, or trying to do so. I mean, as it says, history will tell whether or not this is the case. But it's a very creative reimagining of what is possible in the world. Um, so yeah, I think that's my ten minutes. Mm -hmm.